strong and courageous and do not be afraid. The Lord goes with you each and every day. He'll never forsake you. forsake you. Oh, don't be afraid. He'll never forsake you. Good morning to everyone. It is see, it's good to see all of you coming out this morning to be together. Let's stand, to, let's stand together, sing our three songs here, and get us started with our, we will worship the Lamb of Glory. So I guess that's implying we are agreeing to that, right, this morning? We will worship this morning. Let's go. We will worship the Lamb of Glory. We will worship the King of Peace. We will worship the Lamb of Glory. We will worship the King. I bless the name of the Lamb of Glory. I bless the name of the King of Peace. I bless the name of the Lamb. Pick up the speed, you remember. We will worship the Lamb of Glory. We will worship the King of Peace. We will worship the Lamb of Glory. We will worship the King. I bless the name of the Lamb of Glory. I bless the name of the King of Peace. I bless the name of the Lamb of Glory. I bless the name of the King. And with our hands it 
Put your hold to his hand. To my God's unchanging hand. Why don't you hold to his hand? To God's unchanging hand. You better build your hopes on things eternal. Hold to God's unchanging hand. Trust in him who will not leave you. Don't you hold to his hand to God's unchanging hand? My brothers hold to his hand to God's unchanging hand. You better build your hopes on things eternal. Don't you hold to God's unchanging hand when your journey is completed. Don't you hold to his hand to my God's unchanging hand? My sisters hold to his hand to God's unchanging hand. You better build your hopes on things eternal. Don't you hold to God's unchanging hand? Why don't you hold to his hand to my God's unchanging hand? Why don't you hold to his hand? To God's unchanging hand, you better build your hopes on things eternal. Don't you hold to God's unchanging hand? Another old hymn, Great Redeemer. How I love the great Redeemer who is doing so much for me. With what joy I tell the story of the love that makes me free. Till my earthly life is ended, I will sing, I will sing songs above, songs above. When we saw the crystal sea, more and more my soul shall be praising Jesus and His love. He is everything to me, to me. He is. Sorry. 
friend above and be his forevermore. He is everything to me, to me. He is everything to me, to me. and everything, everything shall always be. Always be. I will never cease to be. It's a song of Some of you, between your hands and your toes, you were running out of things to, to move. Let's go ahead and be seated. <clears throat> good morning, everyone. My name is Scott Polkowski. I'm the preaching minister here at South Hills Church of Christ, and it's so good to see all of you today. Boy, I think this is the largest crowd we've had in probably about two months. So good morning, everyone. Good morning, everybody out there. Just want to say welcome. If you are a guest with us today, we'd love to hear who you are. And there's a card in the seat back in front of you. We'd love to have you fill that out. And at the end of service, see me in the back, and I have a special gift for you. If you're online, please send us an email to southhillschurchofchrist at gmail.com and let us know that you were with us. In addition, there's a prayer card in the front as well. We gather every Monday evening to pray over these, and then we continue to pray uh, for you throughout the week. So if you have a prayer or praise request, please put those in the basket in the back. And if you're online, uh, please send an email to southhillspraise at gmail.com, and we will get those onto the prayer list as well. So a couple of announcements. Uh, next Friday night at 7 p.m. at our house is our game night and snacks. Uh, love to see you there. I'm sure we'll go till 10 or 11 o'clock at night and just playing games, hanging out, having fellowship. Uh, bring snacks. We'll provide uh, drinks. Also bring your games and just a, a fun time for young adults to hang out. Uh, last week, a few days ago, there was a group of us who were blessed to serve snacks uh, during the COVID vaccination line out at the fairgrounds. Uh, it was a tremendous ministry opportunity just to thank those nurses and doctors and other volunteers who were out there either directing traffic or doing the vaccination or making sure that uh, the wind tunnel at the fairgrounds there was uh, all good. And so we did that, uh, served coffee, tea, water, um, even gave out a few of our uh, South Hills cups, and it was a really cool opportunity. Really nothing to it. Um, it's just nice. All you have to do is smile, even behind your mask. People can tell in your eyes. And uh, if you've never been there, it is just a party. And so it's, it was just a lot of fun. There was music, and uh, people were just really in a great mood. Uh, so we have another opportunity to do that at the end of this month. Uh, if you would love to go out and for an hour or so just hand out snacks that you didn't have to pay for and uh, say hi and thank people for their service, we'd love to have you join us on March 30th between 3 and 6. Uh, if you are interested, let me or Diane know and we'll put you into a slot. It's good to have you know at least two people out there at a time and uh, just once again, wonderful uh, opportunity to serve our community. Uh, also, very important, I'm sure you have seen Aaron up here before, he's done a couple of things, but we wanted to officially say hi to Aaron and Ashley because they are both here today. If you didn't know, Ashley is pregnant, and uh, so they are in the back, so hi Aaron and Ashley Jensen, we are so blessed to have you with us. And uh, Aaron will uh, continue, um, he's going to be teaching class in a few weeks as well, and uh, they are just such a wonderful couple. They're so glad to be in Montana, and we're so glad to have you with us. And uh, Tom, it's all yours. A few more songs of praise as we lead up to our time in uh, communion together, listen to our hearts, I sing praises, and then great are you, Lord. How do you explain? How do you explain? Yeah. 
Titus, but when the goodness and loving kindness of God our Savior appeared, he saved us, not because of works done by us in righteousness, but according to his own mercy, by the washing of regeneration and renewal of the Holy Spirit, whom he poured out on us richly through Jesus Christ our Savior, so that being justified by his grace, we might become heirs according to the hope of eternal life. Will you pray with me? Father God, um, we are just thankful to be able to be here together, um, to know that um, you have saved us not according to our works, um, but because you love us and you care about us, and um, that no matter what we do, God, you um, will be there and you will um, be with us. So we're thankful for that and for the opportunity to be here and to break bread with one another and um, rejoice in the life that we have in you. Amen.
Let's pray for the cup. Father God, um, again, we are thankful um, that you that you died for our sins and um, that we're able to rejoice in that and um, not rely on our own understanding, but that we can um, always refer back to you. So help us throughout this next week um, just to, to, on a daily basis, remember uh, the sacrifice that you've made for us and that um, in times where we're feeling stressed or overwhelmed, that we can just take a second and stop and remember that you are God and, and uh, you have created us in your likeness to rely on you um, in all circumstances. It's in your son's name we pray. Amen. Good morning. I'm Don Emerson. I am uh, presiding over the offering. This is my first offering. And uh, as a new Christian, I spent some time yesterday looking at the uh, Christian tradition of giving or offering and uh, found plenty in the, the scriptures uh, regarding offering. But uh, one of the things I ran into was the principles of Christian giving or offering, which I uh, new to me and I thought was good. So with that, an offering is a voluntary donation to the church for charity. Beyond money, an offering can be volunteering one's time or one's talents, doing God's work, helping mankind. The first principle, principle number one, God expects us to give from our first fruits. There is a con concept about first fruits giving that is taught in scriptures, starting in the Old Testament running well into the New Testament. The first fruit sacrifices had to do with God's expectation that his people should always set aside the first part of their crops and produce as a thanks offering for his goodness. Principle number two, giving should be a joyful experience. Give with a glad heart. Principle number three, we should give as we have been given. Proverbs 3, 9, honor the Lord with your wealth and from the first of all your produce. So your barns will be filled with plenty and your vats will overflow with the new wine. Luke 6-38, give and it will be given to you a good measure, a good measure pressed down, shaken together and running over will be poured into your lap. For with the measure you use, it will be measured for you. And uh, the, the best scripture I found uh, when it came to the offering was Mark, 12, 41 through 44. Jesus sat down opposite the place where the offerings were put and watched the crowd putting money into the temple treasury. Many rich people threw in large amounts, but a poor widow came and put in two very small copper coins worth only a few cents. Calling his disciples to him, Jesus said, truly I tell you, this poor widow has put more into the treasury than all the others. They all gave out of their wealth, but she, she gave out of her poverty. She put in everything, all she had to live on. So with that, will you pray with me? Lord, we give thanks for this last day of February and for the beautiful taste of spring we are starting to get, starting to enjoy. We give up our offerings, whether they be money, time, or our talents, and we do so with a glad heart. We give thanks for our blessings and our bounty in your son's name. Amen. And as we sing this song, let me uh, remind you about it. It's a song where we, the group would answer a leader standing up here. Well, I'm not going to uh, do, do that part today. I'm going to let Keith Lancaster do that. And so we will let him be the leader and we will follow after. Let's stand as we sing this. Lord, the people praise you. Lord, the people praise you. Lift you up and praise you. Lift you up and praise you. Because you are the Holy One. You are the Holy One. You're the one, you're the only one. You're the one, you're the only one. Lord, the people love you. Lord, the people love you.
Well, good morning again. Boy, that would have been really interesting. I don't know if you noticed, but I almost came up here without my microphone. <laughs> I would have had to have stood back here, which, as you know, for me, isn't going to work. Uh, but just so good to see everybody. Uh, I do want to point out a couple of people that were uh, very helpful this week. First off, I'm sure you noticed uh, the cross up at the top there. I want to thank Randy for his handiwork and putting that together. I mean, it is the perfect color to be up there. It's just gorgeous. And then, to get it up there, I want to thank Tom. Thankfully, we have somebody who has a scaffolding uh, just at his house. <laughs> and so, uh, it's way up there, and uh, I got to tell you, when Tom was up there, and uh, there were a couple times where my knees went out a little bit, uh, but such... Uh, such a wonderful thing to have up there and reminders of the cross, especially as we head towards Easter, for sure. And so we continue our series on beginnings. We are actually coming to the end of the book of Acts, the beginnings of the early church, the movement of the way. And so we're going to look at some events that really are going to catapult Paul and the church towards uh, Rome, towards really having the gospel message spread into Europe, which would complete Jesus' commandment to have the gospel everywhere in the entire known world. And today we're going to look at a, a passage that I have to admit has been a difficult one for me to work through. Uh, there is so much introspection that hopefully you will see in this passage uh, that it can be somewhat painful. It was for me. Maybe I'll just have all the pain and you guys will think everything's wonderful, which would be okay. I'll take your pain. But it is a difficult passage because I think of, I've titled it, Paul's words are put into action here. And I think of just our world around us, leaders that are around us who say one thing but act in a different way, or friends that we have that say, I will do this or say one thing and then completely do something different. Uh, it is rare to really find a powerful leader like a Paul who really lives out what he says and what he says to you and to me as how someone should live. Of course, we have the perfect example of Jesus who lived the perfect life, was our ultimate example, but it is also good to have 100% humans like Paul to kind of view and say, you know what, I can do that. I can live out a life that is fully for the gospel, not for myself. And so before we jump in, I want to bring up this slide about our mission. All right, so, you know, 2020 kind of threw some things off. Everybody agree with that? So we had a banner up there that had our 2020 vision on it. And there was a lot of work that went into coming up with a vision and a mission for this church about three or four years ago that we fully intended to implement by the grace of God. Some wonderful things, a lot of effort went into that. And I have to admit, we got a lot done last year. 
It wasn't like as soon as things closed, which will be March-ish, as soon as things closed, we put everything on hold. It's not the case. This was still a community of faith that was still active and involved in the community and making a difference for Jesus. And so we have not rewritten the vision and mission, just kind of we're going to carry it forward into this year of 2021. And so some reminders of who we want to be as a community. We want to strive to be a community, and we're going to focus on that a lot today. A clear pan in our organization, in our ministries, events, and staffing to intentionally develop disciples, create fellowship, and enrich worship. The three ships, as we've referred to them. Discipleship, fellowship, and worship. And all of that is so that we can be effective ministers of the gospel. That's the reason why we have any mission, to direct us, to encourage us, to prepare us to take the gospel out. We could simply say our vision and our mission is love God and love others. Even I can remember that. But that is really what we are all about. And so as we go throughout this year, we will have reminders about our mission, our vision, and our, you know, little purpose statement here of loving God and loving others. That is who we are to be as a community. And so as we go through the book of Acts, that is why we study the book of Acts. And we look at the early church, and we look at heroes like Paul to remind us that sometimes it takes sacrifice to stay on mission. And so we are going to see Paul entering into Jerusalem as he continues on his mission. He doesn't know if that's it. He doesn't know if this is the time where he's going to die and God is going to say, well done, good and faithful servant. But he continues to persevere and move forward. And so with regards to our mission, I just have two quick questions, and these are for you to think about for the coming year. Because we haven't put things on hold. We are launching. What are you doing now to unite and challenge our church community? How are you an active member in this community? We are all called to be active members in our community. And how will you be a part of our mission in 2021? Are you going to be in a fellowship group? Are you going to join the men's group? Are you going to be part of the women's ministry? Are you going to help with the singing? Are you going to help with the children's program when we reopen that and with the youth? How are you going to be involved? Because you are supposed to be involved. This isn't just me seven days a week. This isn't just the elders, the deacons. This is a community that supports each other. I pray that as we enter into what God has next for us, that we will not be distracted, as we're going to see here in this chapter in Acts, the people get distracted, but I pray that as Paul does, we stay on mission to serve Jesus and spread the gospel. Amen. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we are blessed that you have called us to be used for the greatest purpose there is. To bring Jesus to the world around us. To those who are lost. To those who are suffering. To those who have questions. We have the message of hope. Jesus Christ, the Son of God, who died and was resurrected for our sins, conquering death, so that we may live. May we be life givers in our community. May we see where we can fit into your mission. And may we serve you with humble and excited hearts. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, so Acts chapter 21. If you remember, we had a really quick kind of some fast-moving action was occurring, we're traveling from this place to this place, you know, Luke covers 400 miles in a few words, but now we've, we've arrived. We've arrived to the place that Paul has been looking forward to. He has wanted to be here for this festival for the last few months, and he's been focusing on that, 
even though he knows he's probably going to face some difficulty. We've talked about that, how he's persevered, he's continued on, even though he's had friends tell him, and he's had a prophet tell him, you're going to suffer, please don't go. We don't need you to do this. We would rather have you be safe so you can continue in what we think your mission is supposed to be. And he has kept going. And so verse 17, we read this last week, but I just want to, it really fits in with the rest of the passage. When we arrived at Jerusalem, the brothers and sisters received us warmly. A warm reception before the turmoil begins. The next day, Paul and the rest of us went to see James, that's the brother of Jesus, who's the remaining apostle, if you will, in leadership in Jerusalem. And all the elders were present. Paul greeted them and reported in detail, and that word in detail literally is each event by each event. I mean, this would be one of those missionary talks that would last hours and hours. This is what I've seen in the last 20 years. They came to faith. The Holy Spirit worked here. They were healed. This happened. Story by story, one by one, what God had done among the Gentiles through his ministry. Wow. I mean, granted, we've had the book of Acts, but could you imagine being in that setting and having Paul right in front of you and telling you these things and just the Spirit filling that room as testimony after testimony is given? And they continued... When they heard this, they did what? They praised God. Of course you're going to praise God. When you hear of the Holy Spirit's power and you're reminded of what has been going on in the world outside of Jerusalem. Then they said to Paul, You see, brother, how many thousands of Jews have believed and all of them are zealous for the law. They have been informed that you teach all the Jews who were among the Gentiles to turn away from Moses telling them not to circumcise their children or live according to our customs. What shall we do? They will certainly hear that you have come. So do what we tell you. There are four men with us who have made a vow. Take these men, join in their purification rites, and pay their expenses so that they can have their heads shaved. Then everyone will know there is no truth in these reports about you but that you yourself are living in obedience to the law. As for the Gentile believers, we have written to them our decision that they should abstain from food sacrificed to idols, from blood, from the meat of strangled animals, and from sexual immorality. Wait, what just happened? The worst word in the English language is but. Think about that for a second. Oh, thank you for doing that for me. But, oh, that was a wonderful message. But, I mean, how can you go from praising God for 20 years of ministry where people are no longer condemned to death forever to going, but, hey, Paul, by the way, we still have a problem here in Jerusalem. And... I really don't feel like we want to address that head on yet, so we need you to do something else. What? Yeah, so, you know, Luke doesn't tell us what this vow is, and it's really not that important. It's just the fact that we, um, Paul, we want you to look Jewish while you're here. We, we want you to, like, really, really show uh, the Jews that have become Christians around here how important the law is still. I mean, if you know anything about Paul's letters, he has written against this type of language and this type of thought. He has fought against this. He has even called out Peter, the great apostle, and said, wait a second, Peter, you made so many strides to the Gentiles, and now you've gone back to the law? Wait a second. No, no, no. What about faith? What about the new law, Jesus? So I know what Paul's going to do, right? He hears this, 
And he's going to go, well, wait a second. No way, guys. Can't you, let's, I think we need to bring these Jewish Christians together. Let me talk to them. Let's address this situation. I mean, that's Paul. That's what we've seen throughout the book of Acts. He's that type of guy. He's going to go for it. And yes, I understand there is a Gentile Jew, Gentile Christian problem happening here, okay? There definitely is. The Jewish faith has been around for hundreds and hundreds of years, and so Christianity has become a part of that for some of the Jews, and so there's some stuff that needs to be worked out. I completely get that, but come on, this is Paul. And so, of course, I know he's going to react in the way that I expect him to react, but he doesn't. I didn't see this coming. I mean, Paul, the next day, Paul took them in. Wait a second, Paul, come on. Stick to your guns. This is what you've been preaching. This is what you believe. No, Paul is all about unity of the believers. He is. He is willing to sacrifice what he knows is the stronger brother in this case to help out those who still need some help to come along. And so he does exactly what James and the rest of the elders ask him to do. For the sake of the gospel and the sake of unity, I'm going to put aside what I think would be best, what I would prefer to do, and go with what you have asked me to do. The next day, Paul took them in and purified himself along with them. Then he went to the temple to give notice of the date when the days of purification would end and the offering would be made for each of them. He goes along with it. And then when the seven days are done, when they were nearly over, the Jews from the province of Asia. So this, I don't know if you remember, but this has kind of been how things have been going. Paul goes to one city, gets run out of a city, and then Christians follow him and stir up stuff in another city, so he gets kicked out again. And they followed him all the way to Jerusalem, hundreds of miles from the province of Asia, from Turkey, so that they can stir up controversy with regards to Paul, this great apostle. So they saw Paul at the temple. They stirred up the whole crowd. And remember, there's thousands and thousands of people at this temple. This is a very, very large crowd. There's a huge celebration going. And they seize him shouting, fellow Israelites, help us. This is the man who teaches everyone everywhere against our people and our law and this place the temple and besides he has brought Greeks into the temple and defiled this holy place because they had pre previously seen Trophimus the Ephesian in the city talking to Paul and so they just assumed that Paul brought him into the temple Paul continually through the book of Acts talks about his Jewishness Paul is proud to have that heritage and on a practical matter, Paul knows, and any good Jewish person knows, that if a Gentile enters the temple, they will be killed. This writing that you can barely see here was found. A couple of different places, it was excavated, one in 1871 and 1935, and it says right there in plain, uh, non-English, no foreigner may enter within the barricade which surrounds the temple and enclosure. Anyone who is caught trespassing will bear personal responsibility for his ensuing death. The Jews were so adamant that they wanted to keep their temple clean that they would stop all that they were doing, take the Gentile pagan person out of there, and kill him immediately because until he was dead, the temple couldn't be clean again. Paul would know that, but these people are just trying to stir things up. To everyone, everywhere, an exaggeration. Turn away from the Jewish law. Leave your Jewish heritage behind. Don't celebrate any of the wonderful celebrations that God has asked them to celebrate. And definitely, he desecrated this temple. I have to sit back, and this is one of those introspection times. What is that conversation going to go like in heaven? Because I believe these are Christ followers who have just made it their life to stir things up about Paul. 
They're in front of Jesus. Hey, um, I'm just curious, guys. What were you trying to accomplish with that? I mean, you left your, your families behind? Aren't, aren't your families your most important ministry? And then you left your gathering of your community of faith behind where you could really be pouring into them and growing and you put all these frequent flyer miles on your donkeys and you've ended up in Jerusalem to continue that? But then again, what's that conversation going to be like with me? Hey, Scott, remember that time when... Oh, yeah. Um, hey, Scott, uh, was that really the right thing? So as much as I get angry at these guys, aren't I the same way occasionally too? Have I done things to be a stumbling block to the gospel for others? Have I put myself and my desires, my selfishness, in front of the gospel, in front of that? I'm sure I have. And so I can't just look at this and say, man, I can't believe they're doing that. Because is God going to be glorified even through this? Yes. God knew this, knew this was coming. Paul probably even knew this was coming. God is going to show up again and help Paul through a difficult situation. And hopefully, this group of people will go back to Turkey praising God for what they have seen the Holy Spirit do. But not yet. Because the whole city is going to get aroused by this mob, this riot. And the people came running from all directions, right? Isn't that how we do it? Something's going on. Let's, we got to see this. Hey, there's another pile up over there. Let's slow down. See what's going on. We're humans. So seizing Paul, they dragged him from the temple, and immediately the gates were shut. Okay, that, you could just look at that and go, well, of course they shut the gates because something violent, blood's going to be shed, we want to keep everything clean. I don't think that's what Luke's in, fully intending here. I think he is pretty much saying, the Jews in Jerusalem are shutting the gate shutting the doors to the gospel. Because that's the last time we're going to talk about the temple. That's it. Paul's going to end up going on to Rome, going on to Europe. The gospel is going to go to the end of the earth. And I believe Luke is trying to tell us that even though the curtain was torn with Jesus 30 years before, and we have access to God, that they're going to shut the door to the temple saying, forget it, we're going to stay with our ways, we are going to ignore this Christian movement, and we're going to continue on the path that we have. It's a sad point in history, especially since in about 15 years, 10 years from this point, that temple is going to be torn down. And then what do you do? Wait a second, we could bow down to Jesus? The ultimate king who's sitting on the throne, who's never going to pass away? or we could keep that temple sacred, but then it gets destroyed. So while they were trying to kill him, so this isn't, I mean, these guys, not only are they trying to stir up controversy, they want to get rid of him. We get rid of this Paul guy, whew, things are going to be great. So they're trying to kill him. News reached the commander Claudius Lysias, we're told later on, of the Roman troops that the whole city of Jerusalem was in an uproar. He at once took some officers and soldiers and ran down to the crowd, when the rioters saw the commander and his soldiers, they stopped beating Paul. So this is an interesting. You have to understand the setting. So the temple is here. The Romans have actually built up a stockade, if you will, that looks down on the temple. Their whole purpose is to make sure that peace is kept because they know Hundreds of thousands of people may gather at a time in this temple and they want to make sure they have an eye on everything. So they have sentries that are positioned to watch and make sure that this type of event doesn't occur or if it occurs, they can simply run down two flights of stairs to get there immediately and quash it. Now what's really interesting about the temple and the fact that if a Gentile goes into the temple will be that and will be killed the Romans even support that To the point that if a Roman citizen were to go into the temple 
They gave the Jewish authorities power to kill that Roman citizen. That's unheard of. But it's all about keeping the peace within Jerusalem. And so the commander is told about it, and he rushes down to see what's going on to stop the fight. The commander came up and arrested Paul. Wait, wait a second. The guy getting beat up? The mobs around him? We're going to arrest him? Yes, it's for his safety. And it ordered him to be bound. I mean, we all saw that coming last week, right? Agabus, here we go. You're going to be bound hand and foot by the Gentiles with two chains. Then he asked who he was and what he had done. So he asked the crowd, hey, who is this guy? Why are you doing this? What's the deal? Why are you trying to kill him? Some in the crowd shouted one thing, another, another, you know, and like nobody knows. Where, where are the guys who started this? They're probably sitting back watching. So nobody knew, and the commander could not get at the truth. I love that word. It really, as we look towards Jesus and entering Jerusalem and talking to Pilate uh, before uh, Easter, and Pilate says, what is the truth? About that same location, only a few hundred feet away from there, this guy says, I want to get at the truth because of the uproar. He ordered that Paul would be taken into the barracks so he could be protected and that they could kind of ask him what's going on, try him, if you will. When Paul reached the steps, the violence of the mob was so great that he had to be carried by the soldiers. The crowd that followed kept shouting, get rid of him. I mean, imagine the scene just pressing in. Uh, and these are Roman troops. These guys are trained for this. But it gets so bad that they have to lift Paul up so they can't get to him. What a chaotic, what a frightening scene for everybody involved. You know there's people get bumps and bruises and they're going to remember this. And so what happens is it's, it's just kind of fascinating. Back to kind of the assumptions that were made before or the statements of exaggeration that were made about Paul. As the soldiers were about to take Paul into the barracks, he asked the commander, um, may I say something to you? And the language there really is, is it appropriate or is it okay if I talk with you? Because you're the commander. So Paul is being very humble. He knows he needs to help quiet the situation. And so the commander goes, wait a second, you speak Greek? As in you speak really... Um, high-level Greek, like an educated man? That's what he's saying. Because he replied, aren't you the Egyptian who started a revolt and led 4,000 terrorists out in the wilderness some time ago? Okay, you have to ask, well, how did we get there? So a little bit before that, there was a prophet who came from Egypt who entered Jerusalem and said, I have a prophetic word the walls of Jerusalem are going to fall, and we're going to be able to overcome the Romans. So he took this group of men, they call them the assassins or the terrorists, took them up on the Mount of Olives, and they watched Jerusalem. Okay, when's it going to fall? When's that wall going to fall? So we can go get, you know, what's going on? You told us. The wall never fell. Troops came from Jerusalem, attacked the group, dispersed everybody, and the Egyptian ran away and went into hiding. So the commander just assumes, hey, the Egyptians come back to start trouble. He must be that guy. Paul answered, wait a second. Come on now. No, no, no. I am a Jew. I'm from Tarsus of Cilicia, which was a very important city, acknowledged by the Romans. I am an important citizen. Please let me speak to the people. I mean, did you catch that? That is Paul staying on his mission. Yeah, can, you know, can I just talk to all these people who are trying to kill me? I know there's a huge mob thing going on right down there and a riot and everything like that, but I have an opportunity here. You've taken me up a couple flights of stairs. People can see me. Can I talk to them? Whew. Paul, what an example. And so the commander's like, okay, I think everything's safe now. And after receiving the commander's permission, Paul stood on the steps and motioned to the crowd and next week we'll talk about that message. And so, back to this idea of community and what, what Paul does 
with the unity aspect and really trying to keep the people together and united as they focus on one thing. Building the kingdom of God, sharing the gospel message, sharing the hope that we all have, testifying to what God has done in our lives. Yes, of course, you see the word community and you see unity within that. And I know, soapbox again, that there are people outside of the church as a whole looking at us and going, wow, they keep fighting with each other. Is that really what they're all known about? Oh, I want to be a community of faith that is known for our love, loving God and loving others. That was how that community was founded, and that's how they were known. And so here's Paul. Let's stay united. We'll work this Jewish Gentile thing out. The faith of God and the power of the Holy Spirit are too big to not work things out. And so as I said, Paul had written about this type of thing often, about what the community needed, and he has tremendous passages in all of his epistles. And like I said, he writes these things, and then we just saw them in action. You know, I have the right to do anything. That's what people say, and Paul believed that. But not everything I can do or will do or want to do is really beneficial. So at times, most of the time, we really should focus on not seeking our own good and what we believe is good, but really the good of others and the good of the community around us for the sake of the gospel. And then in 1 Corinthians again, verse chapter 9, probably one of the more powerful verses about maintaining the unity and, and sharing the gospel and adaptation and becoming weak? How many of us are like, yep, first thing I want to do for Christianity, I want to become weak. Well, if you look at the Beatitudes, it talks a lot about that. Because Paul has a mission. I want to win as many people as possible and I will do whatever it takes to the Jew I will become a Jew and take part in this vow to the Greek, to the Gentile. I will become a Gentile because I want to win as many as possible. Amen. It's all for the sake of the gospel. My sacrifice, my willingness to become weak is for the sake of the gospel. And lastly, out of Romans, uh, you know, Paul's most powerful epistle, most people would argue. You then, why do you judge your brother or sister? Or why do you treat them with contempt? For we all stand before God's judgment seat. There will be a judgment at the end of this time. It is written, as surely as I live, says the Lord, every knee will bow before me, every tongue will acknowledge God, so then each of us will give an account of ourselves to God. I know that's what Paul was thinking when James and the elders approached him. I will be given an account for my actions. This is the right thing to do, even though he may not have believed it. So then each of us will give an account of ourselves to God. Therefore, let us stop passing judgment on one another. Instead, make up your mind not to put any stumbling block or obstacle in the way of a brother or sister. Love and encourage each other. I don't want to be that guy, like we referenced, that goes around trying to stir trouble and is a stumbling block for people to come to faith. I want this community of believers, I want the church in the United States to be known for loving others and loving God and sharing that hope that we have. Amen. Tom? So let's stand as we sing. Restore my soul. Restore my spirit, Lord, I need.
Please pray with me. Merciful God, loving Father, we come before you today praising your name above all others, grateful for the opportunity to gather here. Father, we ask that our worship before you has been one that has caused you pleasure, that the words that we have listened to, the activities that we've been involved in and partaking in your supper, of the opportunity to give and to sing and to praise you, Father, has been a fragrance aroma rising up to you, soothing you, Father, and appreciating, Father, the great love you have shared with us as we, Father, in turn share with you. And now as we go forth, Father, we ask through your spirit to be given the courage and the strength, Father, to carry your message forward, to know, Father, that there are those in this world that struggle and that need your love and support, and that, Father, we can be emissaries and ambassadors of that word and that support to them. Strengthen us, Father. Help us to do what, what we see in front of us. Help us not to shy away from it but to be, Father, those people you call us to be. Truly, your children, the family of God, Father, empowered through your spirit and bound together in that. It's in that spirit and through your Son we pray.